Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to the Festival of Politics 2023. My name is Claire Adamson. I'm the MSP for Motherwell and Wisha and convener of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee of the Scottish Parliament. And I'm delighted to be here today um, to our panel discussion on the future of Scotland's arts and culture. Uh, I'm delighted to um, be hosting this in, uh, on behalf of the Parliament and Edinburgh International Festival. And they, we'll have a short panel discussion with comments from the panel, and then I'm hoping to open it up to the audience to get your thoughts and participation in, in a conversation this afternoon. So I'm delighted to be joined by um, Jean Cameron. Uh, Jean is an internationally respected freelance culture leader based in Glasgow and is the chair of the Centre for Contemporary Arts in Glasgow and a trustee of the National Theatre of Scotland. Uh, Fran Hedgie is the OBE, is the chief executive of the Edinburgh International Festival and has worked in culture, the arts and major events for more than 25 years, <laughs> including London Organising Committee for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And Moira Jeffrey, who is the director of Scotland's contemporary art network, SCAN, and member-led organisation which connects and champions Scotland's contemporary art community that includes art galleries, community organisations and venues, together with individual artists across Scotland. So we're delighted to have such a, a, a well-kent panel uh, and such expertise available to us this afternoon. So um, I'm going to open with um, a question just about, um, this morning we had um, a discussion on the future of broadcasting and we talked about how people's consumer attitudes have changed and how people consume broadcasting in very, very different ways. And we're now in a post-COVID world, we're facing um, cost of living crisis and the challenges. So just to get a feeling of what they feel are the biggest challenges to the culture sector in Scotland at the moment and any insights into innovations that they would like to see coming forward. And I'll, perhaps I'll start with Jean oh, on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here. It's good to see you and good to see a really great audience. So there, there is a blinding light there and good, but good to see familiar faces in the room. So hopefully there'll be plenty of time for discussion. Um, I th I think colleagues, especially from an advocacy point of view, Moira will talk about headline figures and, and, and um, Fran has talked very eloquently about uh, financial challenges in, in the Scotland and Sunday piece uh, facing the, what's facing the festival. So maybe I think one of the big challenges I'd like to talk about is experience. Um, and I, th I just think that there is... There is a real challenge in terms of the uh, how we connect with as wide an audience as as, as how we co-create our culture, how we um, invite people in, how we are. Um, in, it feels to me that post-COVID, the the national conversation and the national changed and shifted. Um, we talk about that a lot at National Theatre of Scotland and it feels like actually it's okay that we still don't know what's next exactly where do we go from here here that EIF talk about but actually there's something about being brave and holding that space for change that I think is a real real challenge in terms of how to hold that quite expansively um, and in terms of work, in, in terms of deepening our connection with everybody's potential in Scotland, everybody's creativity, actually, how do we engage people to say actually that, that this this is something that you can see yourself in, or actually the best ideas may come from you? So that 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 um, dynamic of communication and experience is something that I think we need to we, we need to shift how we talk to potential um, participants, audience members. I'm going to give you an example of something I thought was great. Um, and I saw it this week, and we, uh, just 
Market Street coming off the train from Glasgow. And you know, it's, it's a real flurry of posters out there for all the different festival shows, etc. But the one that caught the, the, the poster, and it was on the street, so it was, on, it was on the street. One, before I tell you what it was, it wasn't something that I had to have signed up to a, a, a social media channel for. I didn't have to be engaged already um, with that particular organisation. It was just happenstance. And I saw it in the, 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 the street and it was the fringe. And it was the fringe's um, sensory backpacks. There was, a, there was a, a big poster competing about, you, you know, there was all the stuff about shows, but there was a picture of, of, of a kid with a beautiful sensory backpack there saying, we at the Fringe have these available to you. And I thought, gosh, actually, that might be the one thing, if I can see myself, if it's, I thought my own friends and the young people, I thought, that's the thing that's going to make me want to experience the Fringe. We'll take it from there. I know that I feel welcome, resourced, and I thought that was great. Fantastic. Um, Moira, from your own organisation and, and the, the, the area you come from, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges? And so I'm, I'm looking with some anxiety about this, the future. Um, I'm not sure that I can see the future, but I hope we might be able to talk about the future and build the future together. That seems really important. Um, the pandemic really taught us that we couldn't see what was coming down the line. It also taught us how significant culture was for people's sense of themselves, for their health and well-being, and it taught us that we can cope with crisis. Um, I think we're actually in a perpetual state of crisis. I'm, you know, happy to talk culture budgets if somebody wants to, but it's not just that. The planet is on fire. We're living through a cost crisis. We seem to have a massive crisis of inequality uh, currently in the United Kingdom. Um, and in that context, I think we have to think about what are the skills that we need for the future? How do we want to shape the future? So I would flip this title, rather than saying, what's the future of Scotland's arts and culture? I would say that Scotland's arts and culture is our future. I was lucky enough this year to speak at a graduation ceremony. Um, it was the one at Glasgow School of Art. Um, sadly, uh, obviously not in the, the GSA building, but at the Butte Hall at the University of Glasgow, with all these amazing young people. And I was speaking to the people who were graduating in architecture um, and in fine art. And those people are the people who are going to build our future. They're the people who are going to build our livable cities, our green neighborhoods, our carbon adapted buildings, they are the people who are going to have the skills of collaboration, flexibility. They are going to be the educators, the trainers, the facilitators and the conversation holders of the future. So we in the culture sector are the standard barriers for the new generation who are going to come through. Where the challenge lies is how we keep the door open for people. Um, in my own organisation, we're incredibly lucky. I, work with museums, galleries, production workshops, uh, organisations with no building, artist-led. My members are, you know, a wee church on Burra Island, Shetland, which supports artists of all abilities to make work, you know, or a, or a grand neoclassical building in, in Edinburgh. Um, we know from very recent research that our model in terms of being, for example, with the exhibition programmes of being free at the point um, of access, that works. We know that the challenges that people are experiencing around the cost of living crisis, that opening our doors works. The, the most recent research from Creative Scotland that came out at the end of April established that the arts and gallery sector, the museum sector, is thriving. It's bouncing back and it's welcoming visitors. It requires investment. All of this requires investment. Um, and we need to work out how to, how to do that, how to do that sustainably. So lots and lots of challenges, but I feel we don't have any choice because, you know, as I say, art and culture, extremely important to Scotland's future.
Thank you. And um, can I just say, Fran, thank you. You must be the busiest woman in Edinburgh <laughs> at the moment um, with the, right in the, the um, heart of the city during the, the International Festival. But um, what, what are your reflections on what the challenges might be and what innovations you'd like to see coming forward? I, I think one of the challenges I can see is that you, Claire gave us a heads up. She was going to ask this first question and said, you've only got four minutes to talk about the challenges. <laughs> so I think condensing it into four minutes is, is one of them. That, I mean, we're all facing an overarching challenge around the funding and the resourcing landscape that, we, that we're operating in. And I think when we talk about arts and culture, I'm thinking predominantly about the subsidised arts and culture sector that, that I can see a lot of people in the, in the audience working and, and I think we've all, we've all worked in. Um, but I'm really struck by what Moria was saying because I agree that I think culture is the future, arts and culture is the future, because there is no more innovative, creative set of individuals than those that work in the arts. That's where ideas come from. And if we need to think of new ways forward, if we need to think of radical solutions, it's going to come from artists, it's going to come from creators. Um, I think it's absolutely fundamental that we collectively can affect a sort of reshift, a rethink about the position of <laughs> arts and culture in society, but importantly in terms of the economy, in terms of our governmental structures, in terms of all sorts of things, because we know that the role that arts and culture, particularly subsidised arts and culture plays, is fundamentally important to the creation of new work. We're able to take risk in a way because of public public's investment that the commercial sector just doesn't do. So there is a kind of um, there's a sort of flow chart, if you like, from from the work that we do in the subsidised world through to the creative, the commercial arts world, and then all of the things that flow from that. So all of the production skills and all of the exploitation of that content and I know we'll probably come on to IP later but all of the the rest of the economy that's built on the shoulders of what we all do so if you think about Edinburgh at the moment and the number of tourists that are here they're here because of the arts and culture so there's a whole tourism industry that relies upon what we do and on the back of tourism industry there's all the associated hospitality restaurants and taxis and bars and, and all of those things and hotels so all of that relies upon what we do and I think sometimes we have conversations with ourselves only about the arts um, perhaps we need to be a bit bolder and a bit more kind of up you know feisty about about what we contribute so you also asked what might be some solutions to some some of this and so um, this morning we had a, a meeting in the, in the hub with representatives from um, South Australia and I was really taken that um, culture in South Australia is part of a department called, I've written it down here, uh, Industry, Innovation and Science. So one of the things I'm wondering about is whether or not we just get rid of the culture bit of external affairs in the Constitution, because I'm not sure how well it's working, if I'm perfectly honest. Maybe we need a Department of Innovation where we can be alongside scientific innovation, green innovation, healthcare innovation, because I don't know what creativity is if it's not creating something new and being innovative. So that would be my kind of so this, starter for 10. This takes me to a dilemma that I find I'm from an IT background uh, and um, the, the Scottish Games industry, which is a, a huge international success, not as big as it could be, I, do, I, I don't think. But um, again, it doesn't know where it sits, if it's in the economy sector or the creative sector, the culture sector. And yet, we're now doing film production based on games engines and all these kind of things. So, so you're absolutely right. These things are much more integrated than, than we think. So if, if I could take it back to... Um, the skills that we were talking about and the opportunities for young people. So um, I'm from a constituency where, um, you know, um, we ha we've had some great um, cultural icons um, uh, come from and young people, but young people feel 
I think, disengaged from the process. So um, when you were talking about all the production skills, when you go to the, the conservatoire and you see set design and, and it's technology, it's engineering, it's all the things that, that young people might be told would be good things to study, but they don't link it into that cultural and um, creativity area. So um, is there something more we could be doing to open up the opportunities to young people and encourage um, skills and um, articulation into the arts from, from different, um, less traditional routes. Um, well, come to Jean again well, first. I, I, and okay, <laughs> I um, do my sales pitch again as a National Theatre Scotland board member. The, um, in the autumn, I think it's on the, I, I think it's online now if anyone from any school educationalists are, are in, interested or in the room that uh, there'll be a careers investigation day and it's uh, the um, that, that's hosted at Rock Villa in Glasgow and actually I, I think it, I think the first one was post post lockdown um, and um, so it's open to um, young people and their, their educators split into um, I think S1 to S3 and then the, the higher secondary school and it is a bit of a demystification um, opportunity so people can you know see what hear terminology like marketing plan or things like that but spend time with the team behind there so it's a very much embodying what and um, what, what goes on um, back of house, um, which, which I think is really important. And also my experience at, at CCA is the chair at CCA, and we've got a beautiful little film studio in, at CCA, as, um, and that's one of you know we're down the road from the conservatoire as well as down the hill from the, the, the art school. But that those spaces, opening up those spaces for um, students and people to come in and, and access um, skills. But I, th I think, um, you know, I, 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 would, I, I think it's a, a both and f approach, Fran. I, all for the innovation, and that, that's where the sustainability will come from. But culture is also about a sense of belonging and telling our stories of who we are to the world. So I love that culture's in. You would imagine that as the producer of the Edinburgh Culture Summit, that um, it, it sits with external affairs. So those kind of, you know, really digging deep into um, traditional skills, actually, our heritage as, as well, and just um, um, making sure that our young people have access to express themselves and, and know what they're rooted in and feel it's as good as the next place. Yeah. Yeah. Moira. Um, I'm the lucky parent, lucky adoptive parent of two care experienced children. And when my children came to me, with incredibly complex life experiences, but also, you know, huge innate wisdom and charm and intelligence, uh, despite their challenges. It was really difficult for them to settle. It's, I mean, I just, <laughs> I remember them coming to me and I remember thinking, it was round about Christmas time, I remember thinking that I had my best outfit on and my lipstick on, and I was looking great. And I look at the photographs of myself and I look absolutely terrible rabbit in the headlights my young people really struggling to settle in a in a new environment and within a few weeks we established that there was one place in our week where we could cope and where my children find a sense of kind of agency and sense of self at 18 months and two and a half and that was at our local art center around the corner doing 30 minutes of what was then called mini music and that half hour of simple rhythm that was free, that was facilitated with other young people, as my children have grown, one of my children has really significant challenges around uh, neurodivergence, but she can still sing. And now she's not singing at the Wee Arts Centre around the corner, she's singing in Glasgow in the concert hall in front of a thousand people. And all of this has come through the local authority and all of this has come through education and through schools. And it's been local and it's been accessible. It's not been about palaces of culture. It's been about her neighborhood. It's been about trusted adults. So I really believe that 
we must provide within our communities and we must provide routes for all of our children. If our most, these are the most vulnerable children in the whole country, with the right support as 18 year olds, they are standing in front of 1200 people in a concert hall singing a solo. It's astonishing what we can do if we can intervene at the right time. There is so much work that we can do and there is so much that needs to be done to support this kind of work in the mainstream curriculum, to ensure that expressive arts are protected, to ensure that that library, church, community centre is still open. But you know, we can do it. I have seen it. It is magic. Yeah, I, 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 it, wonderful to hear. Uh, I, I sometimes um, wonder if we don't, if we celebrate um, Scotland's successes enough in these areas. Um, so my own constituency, I mentioned, we have Sir, Sir Alexander Gibson was born in Motherwell, Liz Lockhead, very contemporary from last year's festival with Medea, been one of the the highlights of the festival then. And I wonder if 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 our young people. Um, if we don't celebrate enough those successes. But wonderful to hear that experience because one of the, the issues that the committee of the parliament is returning to always is, is this idea of a wellbeing society and what wellbeing means. And we know we have a, a huge issue with uh, mental health amongst young people um, coming out of COVID. And um, it, it's just how, how do we reach further to those harder to reach areas to ensure that young people have those opportunities and are able to get that support? Now, I wonder if um, perhaps, Fran, you could reflect on what the, the International Festival has done in terms of outreach for young people. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I think you, we have to start at school. We have to start when people are tiny. Um, but we have to go even further back, actually. We have to start with the teachers, because if the teachers who spend all day with, with our young people aren't aware of some of the opportunities and the potential, the creative potential, both in the curriculum, but also outside of the curriculum for our young people, then, then we're never going to get there. So I think, you know, embedding the creative arts within the curriculum is absolutely, <coughs> absolutely fundamental. But I think we've also got to bear in mind that for our young people in school at the moment, we don't know what jobs they're going to be doing in 20 years time. They don't exist yet. So we haven't actually got the, the words or the language to describe the, the job titles that they're gonna have or the industry that they're gonna work with. So we've got to be even more sort of fleet of foot around the development of skills that we enable our young people to, to get. So we're thinking about this at the festival an awful lot. And something that we've done a lot in the last few years is really develop a relationship with, with a school. So we've had a residency model where we've worked with a school for three or four years, consistently year after year after year, so that the, st so the students get to know us and we get to know the students and what they're interested in and what fascinates them and where they're going and what's, what's tomorrow. Because, you know, if you sit here at my age, I don't know what, I, you know, I, the 1980s was my heyday, not tomorrow. So to understand that and also to work with the, uh, with the teachers to, to familiarise them with the possibilities within the festival or arts and culture more generally or the creative industries. So, for example, this came to fruition last summer um, at Leith Academy where we did a whole production in the school that completely took over the school and the students ha had all sorts of roles within that, back of house, front of house, production roles. So they really understood and they, they got their, fa their first paid experience of working an event. So they understood actually what it's like to work in, to work in our industry, which is fantastic. And then something else that we do um, with slightly younger students is a programme called Art of Listening where we introduce more, it's kind of what you were saying, we introduce young people to music and teach them how to hear and how to experience and to feel and to hopefully inspire them into a lifelong love of, of music and music and the arts. So I think what you have to do is catch people really early, inspire them, show them what can happen, uh, but also but teach the teachers so that we've, so that we're, it's a cascade effect. So, 
Moira, your organisations are, are very much embedded in the, the communities in which they work. So, um, but do you still feel there are, are um, financial or other barriers for some people actually taking up opportunities when they are in the communities? I'm not sure um, to what extent people see the work that Claire does the rest of the year at committee. Um, but the Culture Committee has been hearing evidence uh, recently um, around culture in communities and has heard about some amazing projects all over Scotland. Um, I think the most shocking evidence that I heard, and we're hearing this all over the place, um, is that one of the really significant barriers to people participating in these subsidised activities was hunger was hunger. It's utterly extraordinary. So there is a bit of me, I could talk to you forever about how tiny the culture budget is and how it's failing and global comparators. Um, I could talk to you about standstill funding and the impact that's having on, on artists every day. But there's, there's something else there, which is there is no cultural policy without housing policy. There is no cultural policy without social policy. There is no cultural policy without integrated transport. You know, we're, we're, there's no cultural policy without health policy. We have to build these things together and we have to build an awareness that whilst I'll say that culture is Scotland's future, it can't carry this extraordinary burden um, of difficult lives that people are living. It can support people, but there is so much work that, that we need to do. We're at the kind of tail end of a particular historical moment and we need root and branch transformation. And culture is one of the places where we will imagine that transformation. But people can't take, place, take part in cultural activities when they are hungry and we need to find ways to enmesh some of the, you know, we, we, we've got a brilliant member platform, a wonderful arts centre in Easter House. There, as well as delivering cultural experiences, they are part of the school meals programme in Glasgow. And joining these things, creating places that are warm, where it's not stigmatic to be fed, where there is dignity, um, is really, really important. And we have to look holistically at all of these policies. Jean, you've, you've got a, a, a strong connection with Glasgow and, and, and some of the challenges in, in, in that city. Um, have you any reflections on, on the barriers that still exist and how we might be able to overcome some of those? In terms of adapt adapting, obviously CCA is, for those of you who don't know, it's on Sucky Hall Street, um, city centre, um, and CCA kind of joked that by the time that COVID came around, it was well versed in, in, in lockdown because it had already had to lock down twice due to the two um, tragic um, Glasgow School of Art fires around the corner. So um, 2014 and 2018 or 16, 18 maybe. Um, so the, the, that, that really affected the, 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 um, the organisation's ability to trade, the, the, the cultural tenants, like Scottish Playwrights, Playwrights Studio Scotland, Scottish Ensemble, everyone had to close down. Um, also, what was happening on Sucky Hall Street at the same time and over COVID is the nighttime econ economy was disappearing. Um, Marks and Spencers has shut down, shock horror. So the footprint on Sucky Hall Street and the surrounding areas has, has, has really shifted. And actually, um, our population now, and our, our, uh, quite not our entire population, but as a growing population in our doorstep, is the are the asylum seeking communities who are feeling very isolated and living in the hotels in Glasgow city centre, uh, Renfrew Street, etc. And uh, CCA has really adapted to um, to welcoming and hosting those communities. We've um, taken on the lease of what used to be, in my day, it was a posh hairdressers on, on, on Sucky Hall Street, 
but then became a vape shop and then was emptied. But CC have taken that space on uh, common, common ground. I have opened up that space in uh, March and actually looking at that being an autonomous um, space that welcomes the, 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 the community with lived experience are isolated. There's, there's community celebrations there. Um, I think it's a, a, the, the, there's classes in terms of using computers, free access to computers, just connection. And that um, it's a distinct autonomous space that informs what goes on in CCA, but also hopefully provides a welcome for those communities to come in to CCA. Um, and I think it's a, I think it's a, a first for um, a, a Scottish high street, if we might say that, but potentially a UK, a UK one. So watch, it's quite young in terms of the programme opening, so watch the space on that. You'd be very welcome to visit. Sounds wonderful. Um, I wonder if, as we obviously touched on funding, it's always something that comes up when we have conversations about culture, but I wondered if there were other um, areas that that we think we, we could be getting more uh, investment. Um, I'm t thinking of, you talked about big bus business, uh, Fran, I wonder about um, philanthropy and, 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 and the arts and whether there's, there's a bigger space in Scotland for that, or do we sometimes rely on what, what are budgets that are really squeezed at, at government level a bit too much for these areas? I think it's a it's a really finely balanced sort of um, coming together of all the different funding sources that all of us all of us have. But the foundational one is the public investment. So because without that, you won't get the philanthropists investing because they they want to know that the commitment is there. And if that commitment's there, then it all it all falls apart. But to what we were saying earlier, I think. I'm struck by what, what Maury was saying about the, the burden that is placed on the arts to solve some of those bigger societal issues. Now, we all want to be as accessible as possible. We all want to be welcoming. We all want to make a difference to people's lives. But I know that when we sit down and lots of people will know this, you look at your funding application you have to fill in and you have to talk about how you are going to meet child poverty targets, how you're going to meet green, the green agenda, community cohesion, health, well-being, every, all of these things that, have got to, that we all want to do on no more money. So we have to do all of these things. And so the, the core of what we're there for, which is to support artists and to develop creativity, is getting squeezed. So, you know, we I really support all of these agendas that we want to do. So perhaps there's something about thinking about across government, all of these, let's face it, larger spending departments, if there was just a percentage from some of those that went into the arts and went into arts organisations that do fulfil those agendas. And I think it would transform our whole funding landscape. So there are discussions going on about things like a tourist levy and how that might be a percentage for the arts. Um, I am not in government, I'm not committing to anything, but those conversations are being had at the moment. Um, Moira, you, you, you mentioned as well the, um, the, the challenges that, that organisations within the community have in terms of, of, of those funding models. Are, are there other areas that you think are yet to be exploited where we, we, we could bring more money into the sector? Or um, is, it, is it harder to get um, recognition from a big organisation or a, you know an arts funding company or philanthropist, do you think? Or um, where does it, I'm thinking, I'm thinking as well about, of course, um, lots of controversy. We talked about the planet being on fire. There's lots of controversy about some of the types of business that are sponsoring as well. Is this something you've come across at all? In I, I think in many of these circumstances, we can look to artists and the kind of institutions that they create. And that if you place artists at the center of these conversations, their ability to problem solve, uh, their ability to build new institutions. I mean, amongst my membership, I think I've got, is it 70 uh, voluntary collectives? Um, Artist-led organisations who are kind of building the future regardless of um, how slow the machine of government or public funding uh, might be. Um, they would hugely benefit from support, many of them, but many of them 
just act and are, are creating uh, new worlds, anything from kind of community interest companies that combine with in, in air, we have Nurture, which is both an art space and a bakery. Um, I had guests recently from Birmingham called Maya Group, uh, who are very aware that in Birmingham, for example, uh, they have the ballet, uh, there's a theatre and an opera taking place, and they've decided they're going to build their own artist hotel. Um, so that instead of paying your money to the travel lodge or the premier inn, uh, that money will be, uh, you know, the, the profits eventually could be reaped by the artistic community. So I think there's all kinds of uh, things on the ground, but let's be realistic. Culture is delivering for Scotland in so many ways and in ways that you might not be aware of. It's delivering, for example, in productivity. We know that um, a visit to Glasgow museums delays a visit to primary care. So we know that you, 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 know, you have less GPs visits. Even just going to an art gallery reduces your GP visit. Um, we know, for example, the work that culture can do in relation to workforce retention in some of the most challenging places. For example, mental health services in the NHS. Those teams who are involved in cultural programming, both for themselves and for the clients and patients that they work with, um, have better retention rates and better health. The definitive study has been done by UCL of all the research to date um, on health outcomes in relation to culture and from infancy to old age and you know, dementia, culture is delivering. But the mismatch between that and public investment, it's not about an ever decreasing sum of money. It's about a massive, <laughs> imbalance and misunderstanding of the the public of public expenditure we are an infinitesimally tiny bit of scottish government spend and a little bit of shifting of pipelines could deliver so much for us and that core investment brings partnership but it also brings and renders visible the day-to-day -day benefits that we are providing every day in the culture sector Jean, uh, yeah, I feel desperate to come in. And I, I, tot I totally agree with the, 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 the fine balance. I think, uh, um, and, and everything, of course, that Moira said, I think we're asking a lot, aren't we, in terms of governments, but we really are asking governments to think beyond their own terms, actually, <laughs> to, um, to be kind and think about the, the future, the long term. Um, and really, that's an ask, but we're asking for that bravery in, in terms of that, 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 that investment from our, for, from our public funders, and that's for us to make the case for that. Um, as I said in uh, my opening remarks, it's, I think we're in a real, we're still in an um, emergent space. Um, it, we're still holding change, and I don't mean just as the culture sector, it's like we're reworlding. We're all if we were somehow able to hold our nerve and, um, and not be hungry, but to just to be holding that space in a more kind, empathetic way across the sectors and have move forward together, I think there's real possibilities. And one of the things that came, came to mind there about business was the opportunity with the, you'll keep me right with this, Claire, is it called the, the uh, business purpose uh, the, 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 the Scottish Commission? There is, I, I don't business know the detail of, the of it. Where, yeah, where, uh -huh. where businesses are being asked, the central idea is that businesses are being asked to um, uh, imagine uh, economic prosperity for our places in Scotland, but also imagine, uh, think hard more about, um, econ uh, think more about social well-being as well as environmental sustainability and I think the cultural projects those members that Moira talked about what's happening um, in our organizations you know we've got we've got a real opportunity in our sector to meet that emergent business commission to say actually to get you beyond your state your shareholders to other stakeholders we we do work with artists that 
innovate, improvise, devise, that have all those skills that can actually, you know, really help workforces as well. Um, I think that's really important. And, uh, you know, looking at, um, again, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but there's, there's one of these multinational branding agencies that does a trust survey globally every year. I think it may be called Ellerman, something like that. But businesses are more trusted, again, than governments in terms of how the public are, are looking for um, guidance across fair work, governance, optimism. So actually, when businesses are thinking about reimagining and re-emerging about who they are, I think we've got a real, if we can get in the room, we've got a great opportunity from our sector. Certainly, um, sounds like an opportunity rather than you know, a, a challenge ahead, you know, and, and I, I guess that's one of the themes we were hoping would come out from today's discussion. So I, I'm very keen to get participation from the audience. And I wonder if anyone would like to ask a question of the panel. Um, we have a hand up lady here. Oh, there's a microphone coming. Uh, thank you. My name is Hazel Godfrey. Several years ago, I went to a talk by um, Alan Riech, the poet and a academic, and Sandy Muffet, the painter. This was in the National Gallery. And I never forgot what Alan Riech said at the very beginning. He said, the arts are not an optional extra. They're an essential part of our being. And I feel that if people, the population, were aware of how important it is, then we wouldn't have this idea that, well, you can cut that bit because it's just people enjoying themselves. Now, I've, my family are all <laughs> involved in, um, you know, music and art, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'm very aware of the fact that they are struggling to be funded. So I think the two things together, it's really important that that's important work and there should be more funding. Right. Always an opportunity for more funding. I'll take another question, maybe we'll come, come back to the panel on reflection. Yes. I agree very much with that, that last uh, contribution. Um, I mean, I think it is important to recognise that art and culture is, is central to our being. It's central to the kind of country that we, we want to be. And I think some international comparisons are, are actually quite relevant here. Um, in, in terms of the amount of resource, uh, of governmental resource that we devote to the arts and culture in Scotland, and, and the same is true of the UK more widely, is pitiful compared with many other countries. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it kind of indicates that our governments at uh, both Scottish and UK level uh, don't recognise that arts and culture are central to our being and they're not doing enough about it. Um, you know, uh, I mean, compare with compared Germany, um, just with respect to opera, for example, the number of opera houses that Germany can sustain Admittedly, it's a much larger country, so we'd expect them to have more. But they have such a rich um, um, range of, of opera spread over quite small uh, cities within, within Germany. I mean, we have one opera company uh, whose funding is only adequate for them to be able to put on one new fully staged production next year. Otherwise, they have to rely on revivals of existing admittedly very successful productions. Um, I mean, it, you know, arts and culture are simply not being given a high enough priority. I, I'm going to come to the panel to just reflect on those two yeah. observations. So I'll come Fran first. Great observations. Couldn't, couldn't, agree, couldn't agree more with you. Um, I think arts is not an optional extra. And we saw, you know, when the festivals and were cancelled during COVID, and nobody could go to any arts organisations. What, what did we all do? We, we, we went to our books, we went to our music, we went to our films, because we can't live without arts and culture, right? So it's absolutely fundamental. Um, I was 
in a meeting a, a, a round table with a group of politicians earlier this week and one of the challenges I said, said to them we, we're going to have a general election coming up in, in, within the next two years there are, every party is putting together its manifestos and there is always this sort of discontinuity or this kind of tension between the rhetoric where every politician will tell you how important how valuable the arts and culture is to society how much they really care and then there's the reality of what happens. So I said to them, when your manifesto comes out, guarantee me it's not going to be on the last page, the commitment to arts and culture, because that's where it always is. And that's, where, that's why I kind of, I'm sort of taken or I'm interested in the idea that we get rid of the culture department, because it's always the smallest. The culture budget is always the smallest. Let's get rid of it. Let's mainstream it so that it is in health, so that it is in international relations, so that it is in community, so that it is in education, because that's what we do. So let's make sure we do that. And just to give you uh, another example on your, on your international, um, I was talking to um, another international festival who take place for exactly the same time in terms of days as the Edinburgh International Festival. They get 12 times the amount of funding that, that, that we do. And they are appalled when we talk about, about the, the level of investment or rather the lack of investment, not just in the festivals, but in arts and culture generally. And they were saying, what can we do? Can we give you an aid package? Can we do something like that? Which is shameful, I mean, absolutely shameful. So yes, but I think we really have to hold our politicians' feet to the fire, because we are the electorate. We're the ones that are going to vote for it. So we've really got to make sure that that rhetoric matches up to the reality. Okay. With all due respect, Fran, I certainly wouldn't be taking away a culture from anyone's portfolio at all. I've lived through the experience of um, a, a, a dear institution in Paisley that was set up by philanthropists, being a museum and art gallery. Art gallery was taken away. It's just a museum now. And actually, the, the, the word, where, where's, where's the provision for art? So I, I, think there's a real, I think there's a real danger in that, clearly. Um, but I, I, I wanted to pick up on both, something that both of you said. And something I was really disappointed in, I, 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 in terms of lessons learned from, from COVID really, but it's somewhere that other politicians other places are sort of looking at it. I, I'm an independent, I'm a freelancer, I do lots of different things. Most of our artists are, are freelance and it's really precarious. Thank goodness there's organisations like Moira's organisation very protective of the artists, but there was something really, and, and can speak about um, strands and programmes that are positioning the artists but there was something I felt in the, the the air if you like that was trusting the independent and the leadership of the independent more um, through like freelancers make theatre and other initiatives during Covid and um, I don't think that power dynamic has followed through as we're all emerging again that 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 that's a, that's a real pity. I, I, I don't see that coming through in the guidelines for the multi-year funding for, for Creative Scotland, for example, where it looks like our governance is to be with diverse-led organisations, of course, but there's nothing about that centres the creative, the independent, the, art, the thinking of the artist there. And I think that's such a lost opportunity. Um, that, that investment in the artists I think is so central, it's really foundational to us having the, the, the organi organisations. And two, two things that give me hope around that, um, in 2020, San Francisco um, uh, established uh, a fund for artists. So 130 artists were given unrestricted, bold, unrestricted um, income for 18 months to actually be part of their, the, the, to the fabric of their place. They're not the central economy, but they make the distinctness of that city really important. And it, it, the unrestricted bit was really important because I guess, like all of, all of us, some life happens. So there was a recognition that they didn't have to have any creative output that was assessed over 18 months equally. There was also, an, also an, uh, a, you know, a recognition within that that they were um, 
likely to collaborate and distribute some of that funding amongst their, their immediate community. So that was, that's through the mayor of um, San Francisco, and I'd be interested to see what's happening with that. Um, and the second one, Claire, and it's, it's maybe an ask, I know you're not in government, but I'm really interested, again, in Spain in, in particular, just now taking on the presidency of the EU in the next six months, looking at the status of the artist. And actually, what does that mean in terms of uh, tax relief, working conditions, etc., for the artists? They're convening, as I understand it, an EU-wide meeting of culture ministers in November um, to discuss the status of the artist. It'd be great if, if we were able to have some of the findings of that shared here. Yeah, that's um, one of the, the, the impacts of Brexit, something my constitution role of the the, the, um, the committee has been looking at is, is is that change and of course much more challenging for artists to and young and emerging artists to do tours um, because of all the Brexit implications from that as well but Moira um, one of the things that came out of Covid and, and, and um, the culture collective as a collective and and that although you're talking about individual freelancers there does seem to be a a movement behind the freelancers now, perhaps a, a stronger voice. Do you feel that yourself, that that's coming through? I, th I, th I think there's still quite a long way to go. I have to say, I have been a funder. I've been a public funder. Um, and in the halcyon days of the early 2000s, my job was an absolute joy in, at the old Scottish Arts Council. I had a couple of years there responsible for the funding of individual artists. And what I learned about uh, the funding of individual artists was the fewer the restrictions and the condi and conditions, the, the better the output was because you're working with people who are experimental and innovative. Um, but I should also say that I'm not a believer in some kind of... I always want people to hold two kind of contradictory things in, in their heads, which is that artists are special people. They're really special. They're distinctive. They deserve special kinds of institutions, but I also want you to hold that they are citizens, they are taxpayers, successful artists are, are employers, less successful artists are endless subsidizers of public work because they put so much of their hard earned income from hospitality jobs and, and call center jobs into cultural production. So I, for example, there's a lot of discussion about things like UBI, I'm interested in those models about how they would serve all citizens. And if they serve all citizens, can we also examine how they might serve the artistic population? But I don't want to see a kind of cadre of super subsidized artists, um, you know, without limitation, almost always because when you have those kind of academy style structures, that was something we were looking at in the early 2000s. It always goes to, you know, white men over 65 who are already rich. You know, those, those kind of things that support, that support people at that stage. But we did see in the pandemic that emergency funding for people who had credible artistic careers moving quickly did save people's livelihoods. Small amounts of money when they were needed. So I'd be really wary of creating some kind of... A, 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 tax. I mean, we use these fiscal measures for all kinds of things. Fiscal measures are, you know, used to promote all kinds of business activity. It's perfectly okay to use fiscal measures as one part of a kind of complex mechanism of support for artists. But I think that we have to be really aware of where support is targeted. Mm -hmm. And that should be around emerging practice or disadvantaged practice. It might, again, also be particularly targeted at older people who've suffered disadvantage. Um, and I think we have to be wary of creating a kind of super class of kind of academician model, um, which was genuinely on the policy agenda, I think, in the, in the early 2000s. So there's, there's a kind of range of responses, but I want, I, I want to hold on to that idea of artists having agency, citizenship, rather than, you know, being subject to policy. It's artists who create our world. And I'm wearing my badge. They make that world better by my summer campaign. Artists make a better world. So hold on to that sense of agency. We are seeing, for example, in this city, amongst all the challenges of the town centre, um, artists taking over disused office buildings, creating studios, creating new mechanisms. So, so, so let's think about them as active 
citizens to work in partnership with, not as people deserving of sort of sympathetic or inappropriate support, but as people that we should collaborate with. Absolutely. I was interested in the comment about it, it being um, central to who we are, our culture, and um, the lady mentioned Alan Rayock and Sandy. Um, now, they, they've just released a new book about Brown's Bank, um, some lovely poetry in it, and it goes back to my, my point about making art and successful art and successful um, artists and poetry that's current and relevant part of the curriculum uh, instead of maybe rolling out Robert Burns once a year to do a bit of Scots and that's part of the education system. So it would, re would be really nice to see some of those things more embedded. Um, I did, did I see uh, um, the, the chap sitting here? Did you want to contribute? Did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Barry Essen. I'm from a company called Arica. We're an RFO. Uh, people don't know that means that we're regularly funded by Creative Scotland. Um, I, uh, I was listening to people talk and I was thinking about Margaret Thatcher. Um, when I was a teenager, I remember seeing Thatcher on Newsround, touring around a uh, um, university in Sheffield, just shaking people's hands. And she met somebody and said, oh, no, what is it that you do? And I was, oh, I study uh, ancient Norse verse. And she's like, oh, what a luxury. And uh, what does that do for us? Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think that points to this kind of level of conditionality that everybody's talking about here. I think this conditionality of having to say that the arts is involved in well-being or the arts is, invo the arts is going to solve the... the uh, of course, I, I, I work for a political arts company, so we deal with all of these, these, these things. But um, the conditionality that's placed on arts companies now, I think, is a symptom of a very kind of neoliberal managed decline of the, of the cultural sector. And so we're, placed, we're asked to be innovative or creative or uh, um, what were some of the other words that were thrown around, or, or to like explore philanthropy or something. Um, these things are, are conditions of the fact that we don't value culture for, for itself. Uh, it's only valuable if we can meet some other conditions that are placed on us. Those are more and more. They become more and more impossible to meet. In fact, it's, it's, it's asymptotic. We'll never meet them. And as much as we try to meet them and demonstrate that we meet them, that argument is more or just placed on us and it's never enough because we've already having the argument on the wrong s question. We're already trying to argue with people who think that we have to justify ourselves through what we can do for housing policy or what we can do for well-being or something. That's, we've, lost, we've lost the argument at that point. We're, we're arguing about something that, that, as has been pointed out on the panel, um, other parts of government should be dealing with. We can interact with those things. Our organisation, we're the only organisation in Scotland ever to be nominated for the Turner Prize, and we work specifically with around housing, migrant communities, sex work, um, a, a whole bunch, a range of social issues. But we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be sat and tasked with having to address these bigger policy level things when we should be given the space. The culture is, is li like we say, it's how we tell our stories, how we understand ourselves. It's how we make meaning, you know. The, it shouldn't be conditions that we should have to be meeting. It's like the meaning that we create that we should be celebrated for. Um, so, yeah, listening to some of the things that are coming off the stage reminds me very much of Maggie Thatcher and the neoliberalisation of the arts. And um, I'm sorry to hear that. So thank you for that contribution. Um, so I, I'm trying to reflect some of the work that's happening in the Parliament at the moment in terms of, the, of what the, the, the committee has looked at. But I'm also very aware that those conversations are being had in, uh, in, uh, from Westminster about what kind of courses should be funded, how we do that, that kind of thing. So I absolutely appreciate um, where you're coming from. A any reflections on yeah, that I, comment? I, yeah, I've got one. I, mm -hmm. I, I huge sympathy for, for what you're saying. I think I, I talked before about the the um, requirements of the Creative Scotland form, and you'll be familiar with that. And I had a conversation with somebody who runs a big sports event not very long ago. And I said, oh, you know, I've just been having a conversation about what, how we can demonstrate we contribute to tackling child poverty, right? So, and he looked at me blank, and I said, do you not have to do that? And he's just like, no. 
What? So there's a complete asymmetry and inconsistency about what the arts is expected to do within those very small budgets and the expectations that we have around other things that government support like sport that or don't get or business or but yeah precisely precisely and because we're all lovely people that work in the arts we want to contribute to those things we want to but i think um you know we just stretch ourselves so thinly and what is what is then lost is that very core of supporting the artist and the creativity the core of what we do the thing that's utterly unique that nobody else can do so we we've got we have to challenge that somehow and find a way Jean, any thoughts? Again, just thinking at the arts and nature were the things that kept us afloat. How on earth have we just not kind of held on to that moving as we've emerged? That really, you know, it just... Uh, I th so there's something about, yeah, very small uh, actions of hope and optimism and creating that artists do that um, I, I, I just think are the, the like talismans and actually those small things being repeated create patterns and somehow bringing those rising to the top I just think we've let go of the, the simple the simple the simple essence things quite quickly but I think that is about conventions as I mean we are working you, you, you're trying to work in the arts in a, in a way that's breaking down those conventions very very much as a, 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 a as a sector in terms of allowing space for new 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 ways which actually are based on old knowledge to uh, come to the fore again there was a glimpse of it during Covid I think holding space and finding space feels like a luxury right now because we haven't got we haven't got the capacity to do that because we are so busy trying to satisfy 15 other agendas and that that holding space just isn't isn't happening so I feel really like we need systemic change where we completely reposition what we do in relation to civic society and to take, you know, it's got to be about creating art for art's sake, and it's got to be an acknowledgement that there's a contribution to these other agendas. But that is not why we exist. Art is something fundamental within us and within all of us that we can elicit and facilitate and encourage and support. But it's not to solve child poverty. It's because it has a value in its own right. If I could just say, I think that's a really helpful and really interesting contribution. And I'm going to go away and have a really hard think about the potential that I might sound like Margaret Thatcher. I think there's a distinction. <laughs> I think there's a really interesting distinction between us to being serving somebody else's agenda and the agenda that artists choose for themselves and an interest in kind of demonstrating where people reach and the effect of the work they do versus the set of demands. Every room that I go into with a politician, I guess you turn your face to the sun to try and articulate in language that they understand some of the work that you do. And maybe you become too conditioned about that. And I think this conversation is really helpful in reflecting on some of that. Um, I think there, there's spent a lot of time really recently trying to understand what's kind of motivating practice. And a lot of it is about modelling the future and creating this kind of infrastructure of the imagination of better worlds or creating pockets of places that are better worlds than the worlds that we kind of currently live in. And I think that's important to kind of raise that as a kind of conversation. But I'm listening really carefully. I'm certainly, there's not one bit of me that says that we should be serving other political masters. But I want other political masters to understand what it is the culture sector actually does. All of this work that we do that is, can be transformative. I'm really, really uncomfortable about words like innovation, because I do think that's, that's Mrs Thatcher in science mode, isn't it? Um, and I, we need to find what those words are. You know, that's a word in my office, innovation is kind of banned. 
because it's it, it's not effective. Insightful is my other banned word. Please don't ever use the word insightful. Um, for some reason, that just really sets my teeth on edge. But I, I, you know, I want to hold that really troubling thought about wh where is it? I mean, am I in rooms like this too often? Am I not understanding what it is that artists kind of need and want to do? But I've spent a lot of time recently one-to-one -one with, with artists in a kind of consultative setting where many of them are saying to me, that actually they want off things like exhibition treadmills, they're struggling, but they do want to work with communities. They do want to understand much more about the mechanics of the world that they're part of. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna get my hair done when I go home and, <laughs> and just try out that kind of Thatcherite modeling, see if it, <laughs> see if it, see if it works. It sits slightly uncomfortably with me, but a, re a really, really helpful uh, uh, contribution about kind of touching base with core values so thank you the um the culture committee will be publishing our, our culture in the community inquiry um sh shortly after we return uh, in the early autumn um but i will say that the, the the emerging themes that really stood out to me um was from hearing from artists that all of a sudden because covid changed everything for everybody they had to they, they they could stop jumping through the hoops ticking the boxes all of a sudden they became trusted organizations by the funders to go and deliver what they thought they should be doing in the communities and the other thing that i saw from that in my own community in particular was it was the the artists the the, the um, cultural organizations that were able to do that really quickly really pivot and that's all goes down to the creativity we've all been talking about there so um so that's certainly something that i've learned from covid and and when we talk about culture being core to certainly covid for all of us what we missed and what it impacted on was that 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 connection with community and connection with culture and the ability to share the experience um with those around us of attending events and and seeing that in action. So um, certainly um, those themes have come out in the work that we're doing, but I'm, that's me rambling on. I'm looking for more contributions from the audience. Anyone, the, there's a lady here uh, and I'll come to you next, sir. Thanks. Sorry, it's a bit, um, a bit Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, milk snatcher. One of the um, most horrifying comments I think I've heard in a long while is the barrier to engagement is hunger in this country in this this time i mean and surely we have to address that because what kind of country do we want to live in when actually the biggest barrier to folk access in culture is hunger i mean it's a basic human right to have enough food especially if we live in a country like this i mean it's appalling more a reflection than a question but i don't know what do we do with that information, Moira? I mean, you mentioned it. Where does that go? Where does that sit with this? So, so we, we certainly um, are aware of increase in food bank use and we all have our caseloads as MSPs and know what the challenges are. But, and uh, I, I came to politics through the closure of Ravenscreek, which saw the biggest male unemployment in um, Europe at one point in my constituency. And uh, I thought that was the worst things could be, but I'm more scared now than ever for, for, for my constituents. So um, certainly one to reflect on. So you, the gentleman with the glasses, you had to your hands up as well. <laughs> um, hello, uh, I, uh, my name is Stephen Lacey. I was until recently the chair of DG Unlimited, which is a small voluntary organization in Dumfries and Galloway. And um, I have a question which I, you may be able to answer, Claire which is that in about 2017, 2018, I, I can't quite remember the date, um, we, along with a lot of other organisations, contributed to a, a cultural strategy for Scotland, which was initiated by the government. Now, certainly part of the discussion at that time was that that strategy would be fed through every single other department, so that they, every initiative, whether it was in housing or education, etc., would be forced to take on board the cultural strategy. And then I'm afraid I lost track of what happened to it. Did it fall into a black hole or what? Okay. I think the main thing was COVID happened. We've also had reiterations of government since then, so change of personnel at the top of the portfolio. 
but it's certainly something that is still on the agenda. And Moira, you, you were involved in that process as well. Do you want to, to just say a little bit about your experience of it? Um, <laughs> and if it's awful, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, the, the, the committee is a really interesting place to be and it's been incredible for, for a tiny um, organisation like us in a sector that is so, I hate that word sector, community people, artists, arts organisations, um, the, the opportunity to begin to understand the processes that, that were part of whether we like it or not is, is really important. But I hold that work so that other people don't have to, if you know what I mean. I'm not expecting everybody to to be interested in it. Uh, the cultural strategy pre the, was a bunch of random aspirations that had no budget attached, had no significant mapping or research, that no sense of, you know, if you're a local authority, you're trying to work out what school provision you need to make. We, there's no map of culture in Scotland like that. Nobody knows where the, the desire is, where the communities of artists, where, 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 where there is need, where there is provision. It's, it's a blank. We, we, the, the map exists simply because of the activity on the, the, the ground and there is a complete lack of strategic context. And the, the strategy didn't deliver a grown up governmental picture of what um, culture should be. It, did deliver a set of aspirations that do seem to be what we call cross-portfolio. They do seem to be aspirations around a, a, a national geographic picture where that you have the right to participate in culture in Gearlock as you do in Galloway. Um, but I don't know, last year during the crisis, there was, a, there was a, a suggestion that there would be a refresh of the culture strategy. I know that Clear's committee have tasked um, SG or, or the CABSEC with updating us on this. There is no picture, there is no action, there is no plan, but there seems to be a kind of shape of obligation that maybe that's what Barry's talking about, an expectation that, for example, funding mechanisms will deliver and expect the cultural sector to deliver across policy areas or geographic desires. Um, but where the governmental responsibility for that is, where the action is, where the investment is, there's just a massive mismatch. It's not what I would call a strategy. I, I just Can wanted to say that I have been on a workshop recently mm. with, with colleagues from um, the culture division, uh, just going back, revisiting what the strategy was. So that, that feels to me, it was, in, it was in May, it was during one of those really long bank, those many bank holidays, and everybody was a bit tired. It was on the call, I have to, I have to say, that kind of wanted to go on the holiday. So that was quite recent, that was May. But that feels like those conversations are live. Yeah, I mean, I've attended every single one of those, but I think, I just want to be, be frank, that we're not seeing any movement. Nothing is happening. The, 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 you know, we, we met with the cab set the other week. The cycling seems to be taking up a huge amount of work of the directorate, the kind of mega event culture that we're subject to in Scotland. Um, so I'm not, I'm not seeing action. I'm not seeing... I'm, I'm, I'm just not seeing that kind of governmental context at the moment. Interestingly, the cycling's been termed as a major event, major event set underneath the, culture, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and not under sport as well. So one of these um, dichotomies in, in, in uh, government sometimes. Fran, have you any thoughts on, on the, the policy and the strategy? If I knew what it was, I could comment on it. Um, I think I think there's just an absence of strategy. There is, I've, and I've lost count of the conversations I've had with CABSEC and ministers, and to say, what is the strategy? And there, there is none. Is the honest truth. So, and, and in the absence of that, then what we do is fill the gap by trying to respond to every single different government initiative and priority, because there isn't one for culture. There is no strategy for culture, and that's a sad place to be. So that's certainly um, interesting. I know, certainly be taking that back to colleagues and through the committee. I thought, I thought this was a more relaxed forum. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, um, uh, the lady at the back of the room, would you like to, to, to ask your questions? 
Hello. Um, <coughs> it was more like um, a comment on the um, people are um, the main barrier to culture is hunger. Um, to me, it's not um, it's not helpful. Um, and the reason why is because I feel that when we fight for different causes, when we go on a march um, against climate change or when we go on International Women's Right, uh, Women's Day, um, we're not meant to feel guilty about it. Uh, we think that it's, uh, it's a good thing, it's socially acceptable. However, when we want to fight for the arts, uh, we are we're kind of taken for, uh, I don't know, a bunch of privileged people, but actually access to like participation to arts and culture is a human right. It's actually listed uh, in the, in the, I didn't know that until last year, um, in the International Declaration of the Human Right. Uh, and arts and culture is a public service. And that when we fight for arts and culture and more public funding for arts and culture, we're not fighting at the expense of other public services. We just believe that all of these public services are important. Um, my name is Ondine. I've been involved in the Save the Film House campaign. Um, so over the last nine months, ten months, we've been organizing public meetings with consultations where to find a consensus to try and reopen the film house. We, we organized a protest in front of the film house and then a national arts protest that is bigger. And I was really... Um, it was kind of heartwarming to see so many people who were ready to stand up for culture and write to their local councillors and uh, MSPs. And after 10 answers of, oh, but what about the NHS? Or what about trying to divide us amongst ourselves to be, to, to finally reach like a, the kind of the comfort that what we're doing is right. And as a citizen of Scotland, well, I'm not actually a citizen, as a resident of Scotland, <laughs> actually have a citizenship um, I would want to see our decision makers fight more but so maybe they are on a day-to-day -day basis because everyone is burnt out overworked etc but I would want to see them fight more for more investment in arts and culture and not just accepting things as they are and operate within our capitalist system which is you know on a day-to-day -day is what's going to happen. But ultimately, if we don't fight, things are never going to change. And our cultural sector will continue to dissolve as it is dissolving right now in front of our eyes. Um, so that, that's all I want to say. Yep. Sure, Moira, you want to? Uh, uh, there's just something I wanted to say, which I didn't. I, I don't want to say that the primary barrier to cultural participation is hunger. That's not what I was saying. So, so if I, if, if, but I noted that one of the barriers to, to, um, that was expressed was hunger. And what I'm trying to say is not that it's culture versus hunger, it's that hungry people deserve culture. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, is that hungry people are as entitled to culture as sated people and fat people like me. That, you know, that, that's, the, that's what I'm saying. So really, I'm not suggesting that those are, are oppositional things. And when I talk about all the different ways that culture may operate in, in complex ways. It's not saying that, that because I'm placing a, a different value on those. So, so please, do, I don't want to be misunderstood about that. And I understand the absolute challenge that people have faced to, to lose something that they loved. And I think we can see that that will happen again and again for lots of different reasons, complex reasons, not just reasons of money, sometimes reasons of structure and allocation of resources. Um, but I know how hard you're fighting for something that you really uh, wanted and need. Okay. Any thoughts? Yeah. Jean? Did you use the word dissolved in terms of the culture sector dissolving? And I kind of feel maybe it's okay that some things dissolve to as long as there's space made for uh, other things to come to come through and it's just it's that in creation of space for things that are not visible immediately that don't look like outputs immediately actually that place for experimentation for the things that we don't know we need now that actually in five years ten years time create a sense of awe, wonder 
purpose. I think it's really, I, I think in terms of this re-emerging, things will dissolve. Um, and I think that's actually healthy and okay, but just act, it's the creation of the, the democratisation of, the, the, of whose culture okay. and those spaces for that to come through. Come, yeah, come absolutely. Through? Because yeah. I think you raise a really interesting um, sort of uh, comment around the idea of competition that actually for somebody to succeed, somebody else has to lose. So that for culture or the arts to get funding, somebody else has to lose. Or even within our own ecology, that if the National Museum gets more money, then somebody else has to lose. And that's really dangerous, because actually the answer is everything needs funding, and we need to raise everybody up. So I, th I think sometimes the debate that we have around this is really, is really unambitious because we sort of accept that there's a fixed and diminishing pot, whereas actually what we need to be doing is working out how to grow it and celebrate when organisations or our individual artists are successful and do attract resources. That's a really good thing. It's, it's kind of like saying, you know, all, all, all money for health should go to GP services because that's where people live and we shouldn't fund those big hospitals. You, you need both. You need everything. You need a diversity of, of provision within, within any sector. And I think we're, we're sometimes really bad at that within the arts of criticising each other and not and just on, on the basis that it's a zero-sum game and I just genuinely don't believe it is. In interesting. Um, I'm afraid... I think we've probably run out of time completely. Um, so it's been a really interesting afternoon. Um, it's, uh, uh, we've gone to, to, to many areas and explored different areas around the, the cultural landscape in Scotland. But um, it's been a real joy and thank you for your questions and participation. But I'm going to leave the last words, final reflections from the ladies in the panel. Fran, can you want to go? OK, last reflection is I think we've We've reached a point where we can't go on like this. So something fundamental has got to change and we need to be bold and we need to be brave and we need to yeah, hold people to the fire, people's feet to the fire. That's what's got to change. I'll be getting my fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> Jane. Well, there's certainly, there's something about pace and just uh, being really conscious of pace. What's urgent? Where do we need to, we can't do everything. We can't have 15 competing things, but actually what takes a long time to germinate? Um, uh, what, are the, what can be our quick, quick wins within um, an organisation? It's something about pace and hold, what needs to be looked at now and really not necessarily looking at critical mass, but looking at critical connections now, um, whether th th they're just yeah, going to protect things longer longer term but the fast experimentation also is really helpful well yeah oh i've just yeah, the got final, so, final I've got words so much <laughs> for me to go home and just really digest but i i'm um, yeah we're just we're, we're living through this absolutely massive mismatch between rhetoric and reality and i'm you know we've had a lovely couple of weeks thanks to the generosity of colleagues of being allowed into political rooms that I don't normally get into and being loved by politicians who are then going to walk away and not d deliver for us. But whatever the solution is, it has to put artists at the centre. There's, like, there's no point if we don't. There's, we're nothing uh, with, without uh, artists' voices, artists' perspectives. Um, and I think that's the, the, the core uh, lesson for our future. We, we'll fail if we don't do that. Can I um, just say thank you very much to all the panellists, um, to um, quite um, diverse and a bit interesting perspectives from your roles and previous roles. So um, to, to Jean and Fran and Moira, thank you very much. Can we please show your appreciation? <laughs> Thanks also to the Parliament staff who have supported this and of course to the Interna Edinburgh International Festival who have been partners in bringing this afternoon's panel together. So thank you.
once again. Can I remind people, please fill in the feedback forms that you would have been emailed from Eventbrite or received on picking up your tickets downstairs. We want um, the Festival Politics is, is a long-standing event now in the Parliament. We want to make it as successful as possible. So please do do give your feedback um, to us, and um, and just remind everybody that the festival goes on tomorrow. Um, we, there was something we talked. We I talked with the panel earlier about is ethics and AI and how that might affect the cultural sector in terms of um, deep fakes and you know IP and design and all these kind of things. And actually. Um, script writing and all these things that are, are coming our way so that's maybe one for next year that we can pick up but again um, enjoy your day in the parliament and thank you very much for attending today